Welcome to the Bogosity Podcast for the 9th of March, 2015. The podcast that's one horse shy of a trifecta. This is your host, Shane Killian. And it looks like I'm flying solo this week, so let's de-dupe the news of the bogus. So we've talked before about the dangers of allowing governments to put back doors into cryptography because anything that lets the good guys in can let the bad guys in as well. Math works the same for everyone. This week, researchers announced a newly discovered vulnerability that actually dates back to the 1990s when government made everyone weaken their encryption. Let's start with some basics. We're talking about SSL, which is how websites that begin with HTTPS colon slash slash are secured. We won't go into detail. If you want more information, just watch the most recent video in my encryption series where it covers it. But what we're really concerned about here is the SSL cipher. This is where it selects the actual encryption algorithm that's going to be used to scramble up the transmission. And there are a bunch of algorithms that the web browser supports, and there are a bunch of algorithms that the server supports. And so the web browser sends its list of ciphers to the web server. The web server has its list of ciphers in order, starting with the most secure, which nowadays would be elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman with AES-256 and SHA-256. And so it would look at that top one and say, can the client support this? No, go down to the next one. Can the client support this? No, go down to the next one, and so on, until it gets the most secure one that the client can support. Well, the issue here is that there's a possible man-in-the-middle attack that you can use, and we've known about this since pretty much day one. You can't encrypt the connection until you select the cipher, so all this is happening over plain text. So it's possible for a man-in-the-middle to jump in between and modify the request going to the server and say, I can only support this older cipher, like RC4 is one that's about to become deprecated. So if you have this older cipher that's easier to crack, then you can force the server to select that one, and now the security of the connection is weakened a lot more than it needs to be. So for this reason, every so often they deprecate it. Pretty soon these RC4 ciphers should go away, just like triple DES went before. Triple DES was a really good protocol back in the day, like the late 90s, but times change, computers become more powerful. So as that happens, these older protocols go off the list. Why? I mean, why not have it there? Why not keep it on the server? Maybe there's someone out there using Netscape Navigator 2.0 still and they need to connect. Well, this man in the middle attack is the reason why. We don't want ciphers in there that are too old because we don't want any chance of a hacker using this man in the middle attack to downgrade the encryption so much that they can crack it. Okay, so what does that have to do with government mandating backdoors? Well, in the 1990s, the U.S. government declared that strong encryption was a weapon and that you couldn't export it. So what that meant was you could only export the level of encryption that the government allowed you to have, which was RSA 512, which is a very weak protocol by today's standards. And the reason why they did that was so that the NSA's computers could crack RSA 512 then. Well, if their big supercomputers could crack it then, the computers on our desktops can crack it today. They're just so much more powerful. They're just crazy powerful computers today. But that was what you had to use if you wanted to take it out of the country or transmit across international lines, which meant that software like PGP couldn't be exported. Now, yes, this is as ridiculous as it sounds. Strong RSA encryption, the algorithm for that isn't all that complex. In fact, it could fit on a t-shirt and many people did just that. They put the RSA algorithm. They even put things like Perl code and a machine-readable barcode on their shirt and wore the shirt while they went flying around from America to another country. And yep, that was technically illegal because it was right there on shirt. And so yeah, eventually they realized how stupid they were being and they reversed that and said, yeah, okay, okay, okay. You can have as much encryption as you want. They actually did a nice thing briefly. They said that Computer code counts as free speech, so you can't restrict it. And then later on with the DMCA, they overturned that because you can use computer code to get around copy protection schemes. And so now all of a sudden it wasn't free speech anymore. But for like three years or so, computer code was free speech. So anyway, 
This weakened version of RSA had to be in every browser, every web server, every other such software when it connected from overseas. That was the only way to legally connect because strong encryption couldn't be exported. Well, now fast forward to early 2015, there's a vulnerability called FREAK, which stands for Factoring Attack on RSA Export Keys, except no, it doesn't. That doesn't actually spell FREAK. It's more like FAREK or something like that. Yeah, they have to scramble the letters around to make it FREAK. But anyway, the point is they supported this very weak RSA 512, this RSA export key, separately from the list of ciphers. And this stayed in the code this whole time. It's been there. And so what you can do is you can use the man in the middle attack, no matter what the list of ciphers are in the browser and the server, you use this same kind of man in the middle attack to make it drop down to the RSA export keys. And there you've got a nice vulnerable connection and the way the servers actually work is whenever you boot them, they make just one RSA export key and use it the whole, then the next time they reboot it, they make another. So basically you only have to hack it once and you can get all of the conversations that server is engaging in until the next time it reboots. Yeah, so this is bad. This is really bad. And it's all because 20 years ago, Government said, hey, put this weakness in there. Even though government went back on that and said it doesn't have to be there, that's kind of stayed around in the code. It's kind of stayed with us. It's kind of scary. All supported versions of Microsoft Windows are vulnerable, and probably the unsupported ones too, like Windows XP. Um, yeah, now is probably a good time to upgrade from Windows 98. I hate to break it to you, but... Now, Microsoft hasn't said yet when they'll release a patch, but it doesn't look like it'll be ready for Patch Tuesday, which is in the next couple of days. So maybe next month, unless they do an out-of-band update. Mac OS X is vulnerable. Apple says to expect an update next week. But if you're using Chrome on OS X, they've already patched it. Chrome in Windows is fine. It's not vulnerable. Firefox isn't vulnerable and hasn't been. In fact, I couldn't find a version of Firefox that was vulnerable. It may never have been vulnerable, but maybe it was. Just make sure you update. You always want to make sure you keep your browsers up to date. So do that. Linux should be fine as long as you've updated since January, because that's when the first patch fixing this was very quietly pushed out in OpenSSL. And that's when the security guys went, hey, wait a minute. I wonder if there's something there. So yeah, that's how long it took them 20 years to finally patch that. So as usual, run your updates, keep your system up to date. And also I'm putting a link in the show notes that you can just load into your browser to see if you're vulnerable. So do that on all the browsers you use, on all your computers, phones, tablets, whatever. As far as servers are concerned, any websites that use Microsoft CIS are vulnerable. Any sites on Linux or BSD that are up to date should be fine because they'll still have that same patch from January. Content delivery networks like Akami are putting in patches to make sure that the websites they front end for aren't vulnerable, which may be an advantage of doing it this way because they only have to patch it once and then all these websites get fixed and then you don't have to worry about whether Joe Blow's website is doing it. If Joe Blow is behind Akami, it happens. But all of these have been vulnerable this whole time and who knows how many people, not just in the NSA, but malicious hackers as well might have snooped in on communications we thought were private. So when some politician in the Obama administration or the European Union goes on about how they need backdoors and cryptography, remember this. We've been vulnerable for 20 years because of a backdoor the U.S. government insisted on putting in. Long after they reversed their policy on this. Do not let them do this again. Say, if you're tired of the promos in this podcast, well, the patrons got it early and with no ads or promos. Just go to patreon.bogosity.tv and donate at any level. Hackers, terrorists, the NSA. But I repeat myself. Your online security is under attack, and the weakest point is your password. That's why you need LastPass. LastPass plugs into your browser and allows you to randomly generate strong, unique passwords anywhere on the web, all protected by one master password. 
LastPass sets up in minutes and gives you secure automatic logins throughout the web, synchronizing across all your browsers and all your computers, at home, at work, or on the road. It even securely stores sensitive form data, including credit card numbers. Backup sensitive documents, membership info, Wi-Fi logins, and more. And with LastPass Premium, you can get these benefits on other applications and even mobile devices, and also get priority customer support. Sign up at password.bogosity.tv for a free month of LastPass Premium. Log in securely everywhere using the last password you'll ever have to remember. Go to password.bogosity.tv and get LastPass now. Well, now Jonathan Lachey is joining us. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. Good to be back. Yeah, kind of a little late, but better late than never. Yeah, hey, what could be worse? Okay, so we didn't talk about this on the podcast, but a while ago, Bill Nye wrote some anti-GMO bogosity in his book, Undeniable Evolution and the Science of Creation, and very properly came under fire for it by pretty much skeptics everywhere. Uh, for a guy who dominated so much of my childhood, that, that hurt. Yeah, he hasn't been perfect, but here's an example of how you do it right. When he was backstage at Real Time with Bill Maher, he said that he spent some time actually talking to scientists in the field and says he reversed his views on GMOs and will be releasing a second edition of his book this year to correct the problem. Well, isn't that great? Yeah. And he says he's very excited about revising the chapter and telling people about his newfound love for GMOs, saying, quote, When you're in love, you want to tell the world. That'll be great. I think it'll be uh, good for him. And, and it, it takes a lot to admit that you were wrong about anything. I know. I'm a stubborn son of a bitch about that. <laughs> yeah, it does. And it might mean a little more attention than he would have gotten if he had just come out the first and said, hey, people, GMOs are okay, knock it off. You know, the fact that he actually turned around on this is getting some extra attention. Mm -hmm. So it's better just to not get it wrong in the first place. And there is all sorts of research he could have done to avoid that. But still, no one gets it right all the time. And the one important thing is to let yourself be corrected when you're wrong. And Bill Nye has done that, so let that be an example to all of us. Mm -hmm. And here's another example of someone doing it right. The Swedish ISP bred Benzel Bold or Hindi Hindi Bork Bork Bork, or however that's pronounced. Basically something something meatballs. <laughs> yeah. uh, it translates to the broadband company. They've refused to block the Pirate Bay and other websites and are fighting this requirement in court on the grounds that ISPs should not have to be responsible for the traffic that goes over them. And once again, this is the government failing to understand how the internet works and just doing the bidding of major content providers who are looking for any and every way to go back to 1985 when they had a monopoly on how you got this information. Yep. So they're going to go to trial. It's set for October. Uh, they filed these papers at the Stockholm District Court that said that they have to block their subscribers from accessing the Pirate Bay and Swefilmer, which is apparently a streaming portal. Uh, so in December, the ISP gave the response saying, very clearly, ISPs cannot be held responsible for the traffic on their networks. Quote, it is an important principle that Internet providers of Internet infrastructure shall not be held responsible for the content that is transported over the Internet, in the same way that the Post should not meddle in what people write in the letter or where people send letters. We stick to our starting point that our customers have the right to freely communicate and share information over the Internet. Or as um, Dave Tricot put out eloquently, would the government hold themselves responsible for when someone used a getaway car on a road they built? Yeah, exactly. Actually, I think he was quoting me. Oh, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> but either way. Yeah, and I mean, this was pretty much the only good thing the Communications Decency Act did way back in the 90s, was declare that ISPs weren't responsible for crimes committed by their customers. But once again, the DMCA came along and they took all of that away and said that ISPs would only have safe harbor if they complied with the act. So hopefully more ISPs will take this stance and we'll get this ridiculous requirement expunged from all the legal codes of the world. You say you don't like Bitcoin? Why not? Oh, because it's not gold. No problem. 
Just go to coins.bogosity.tv and you'll be taken to Coinable, where you can buy gold or silver coins or bars with your Bitcoins, with literally up-to-the-minute spot pricing. Now there's no reason not to jump on the Bitcoin bandwagon. Whether you're a Bitcoin miner, service operator, Bitcoin business owner, or market speculator, you can get gold and silver from reputable dealers. And Coinable has Bitcoin liquidity for fast processing of your order. Coinable even utilizes a special shipping infrastructure to ensure that your investment arrives safely at your door. And you know what? By going to coins.bogosity.tv, you won't pay a penny more, excuse me, a Satoshi more for your purchase. But you'll help this podcast. You can even sell your gold and silver for Bitcoin as well. Coinable is your Bitcoin to gold marketplace. So go to coins.bogosity.tv and start turning your Bitcoins into gold now. History is written by the winners, and so apparently is economics. That's why there's libertyclassroom.com. Probably the best single learning resource for history and economics on the web, libertyclassroom.com teaches U.S. history, Western Civ, and economics from actual university professors. There's lots of free material to get you started, including introductory lectures on all these subjects. And when you sign up, you get the full site's content for just $99 a year, less than the price of two cups of coffee a month. And if you type in the promo code BOGOSITY in all caps, you'll get your first year for just $88. Lectures are available in both video and audio format, so you can watch or listen to them on your computer, your phone or tablet, or in your car. Learn at your own pace about the subjects you're interested in and become a more effective debater. You'll also get access to lots of supplemental materials and even the professors themselves via the discussion forum and even live video chats. Inform yourself against the myths and propaganda of our society. Visit libertyclassroom.com. Well, to say the least, there's been a lot of bogosity masquerading as forensic science over the years, including things like matching a suspect using shoe prints. <laughs> and in each case, one innocent person after another gets sent to prison. And now the same thing is coming out with regards to the pseudoscience of bike mark matches. Uh, it, it amazes me that because of all the cop dramas and stuff, forensic science basically gets treated as like, Almost. Almost like holy writ. There's no real skepticism put to it because, it's like, oh yeah, they show they have this on TV and they show all these people believing it a hundred percent. Well, and they do the same kind of manipulation with DNA tests. DNA tests cannot one hundred percent say the person is guilty, like they do on TV, but they can one hundred percent say the person is not guilty. That's not the person's DNA because if just one marker is wrong, it can't be him. Right. But that's not the way they portray it. So. Mm -hmm. so anyway, this is a story in the Washington Post from Radley Balco, and we've seen quite a few articles from him in the past, uh, enough to the point where I'm starting to recognize his name. So uh, he may be a name to watch out for. His articles seem to be pretty good. He was in, uh, he used to write for Reason. Oh, really? Yeah, you didn't know that? Well, I probably just kind of remembered it subconsciously, but I'm looking at this name Radley Balco, and I went looking through the archives on... The podcast, and it's like we've done a few articles from him before, but yeah, I I might have just kind of seen his name, but just not registered it, so. Yeah, um, several years ago he worked, he uh, gave a speech at the Libertarian Party of Florida convention, I remember. What do you talk about? Um, his big thing is the militarization of police. Yeah. So. So this article is titled, How the Flawed Science, and science is in scare quotes, of bite mark analysis has sent innocent people to prison. And he talks about a guy named Gerard Richardson. When he was 30 years old, in 1995, he was convicted for the murder of a 19-year-old named Monica Reyes. And there were only two pieces of evidence against him. One was a statement from Reyes' boyfriend. And the boyfriend claimed to have heard Richardson threaten to kill her. But he only made that statement after he had seen the other piece of so-called evidence. This forensic odontologist saying that the bite mark on Ray's body was a match to Richardson's teeth. And that odontologist is named Dr. Ira Tichunik, who said to jurors, quote, there was no question in my mind the bite marks match that Richardson had bitten Ray's. How many of these people have just been flat out lying on the stand? I don't know. So Richardson said, quote, I thought it was crazy. There was no way it was possible. The FBI looked at hairs, fibers, 
blood, everything the police found at the crime scene. None of it came from me. Just this bite mark. There were only two things on that sheet, and he's talking about the report that Tatunic had submitted into evidence. It said there was a bite mark on the victim and that I had made it. And, and this goes back to what you said, you know, in terms of forensic evidence, and that uh, largely we just accept their word as gospel, when in reality, I mean, plenty of, like uh, ballistics. I mean, uh, there's plenty showing the, the whole concept behind ballistics is complete BS. You mean like matching a bullet to the gun, that sort of thing? Yeah. I think it's another one of those things where you can use it to say the bullet couldn't have come from the gun, but you can't use it to positively match it. Yeah. Like that scene out of The Dark Knight where Bruce Wayne like completely restructures a bullet based off fragments. Oh, yeah. Or even in this case, bite mark analysis. But, you know, unless he had like a couple of teeth out of place or something that would give him a very distinctive bite mark. I would love to know how you could really use that to pinpoint it was him. Well, because it's not like a detailed dental mold or anything like that. It's just yeah. kind of the, the kind of basic shape that's kind of blurred out and eh, kind of, sort of. Yeah. So on the stand, when Tatunic was asked how he was able to single him out, he referred to this report, which is the same report that Richardson's expert witness, Norman Sperber, used to tell jurors that there was no way the bite mark could have been left by Richardson. So they both looked at the same report and came to completely opposite conclusions. Mm -hmm. So what Richardson said was, quote, I thought that was the very definition of reasonable doubt. The only physical evidence against me was Dr. Tatunik's testimony. But my own expert was just as qualified, and he was saying the very opposite. And they were both using the same report. How could that not be reasonable doubt? But unfortunately, I think this is something else that people get from Law and & Order and shows like that. You know, the scientists on the prosecution side are good people just trying to get at the truth, and they evaluate things, and they kind of agonize over it. And the ones on the defense are just making stuff up just to get their guy off. Yeah. So if you've got the two of them to say the same thing, they're supposed to give that weight to the defendant, but they actually end up giving it to the prosecution. Mm -hmm. And he also mentions another case that happened three years after Richardson's conviction. Uh, in 1998, a handyman, Edmund Burke, was arrested for brutally murdering a 75-year-old woman. And, again, the only physical evidence against him was a bite mark expert who claimed to match his teeth to the victim. And that expert was Dr. Lowell Levine, but it turns out he hadn't actually examined the body. He had only seen pictures of it. Nevertheless, he claimed that he could match the dental mold to the bite marks with, quote, a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. And then prosecutors put up a second odontologist to verify the match, and that odontologist was... Ira Tatunic. <laughs> and of course, the system isn't gamed against you. <laughs> well, and it's one of those cases where, you know, just like with the shoe prints, you see the same name coming up over and over again, and you're kind of like, wait a minute. You know, if there's anything to it, why aren't there hundreds of experts out there about it? Yeah. Of course, the government isn't going to employ the same guy to make sure he gets you. <laughs> now, in this case... Burke was in jail for 41 days when DNA testing on the saliva recovered from the bite mark said it couldn't possibly be him, and it actually matched a man who was already convicted of another murder. But in Richardson's case, they weren't able to get the DNA from the saliva itself, and apparently the DNA from the hair and everything else on the victim not being his didn't have anything to do with it, apparently. But two decades later, the technology finally improved to the point where they could get useful DNA from the saliva. And guess what? It showed that Richardson wasn't the killer. He didn't leave the bite mark. No evidence against him. And it makes me, it makes me wonder just how many people we sent to jail innocently before DNA testing. Oh, yeah. I mean, hundreds of them have been released on DNA evidence since then, thanks to groups like the Innocence Project. Yeah. Well, we, well even then, we, we, we did that one show about them. Yeah. Even they're not. Well, I guess no one's 100%, but at least they've done the amount of good that they had. A lot of people are free who were, who would otherwise be in jail or even executed. Mm -hmm. So, over five years ago, in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences published a report commissioned by Congress 
of the state of forensic science in the courtroom. And according to Balco, quote, The report was particularly critical of an area of forensics loosely known as pattern matching. That area encompasses a group of largely subjective specialties in which an analyst looks at two pieces of evidence, such as carpet fibers, hair fibers, or marks made by tools, and it also the things we've talked about, the bite marks and the shoe prints, and simply declares, based on his or her experience and expertise, whether the two are a match. The report found, quote, no evidence of an existing scientific basis for identifying an individual to the exclusion of all others, unquote. That's unquote the report. I'm still quoting Balco. The problem is that this is precisely what bite mark analysts do and what they have been doing for decades. And he goes on to point out, quote, bite mark analysis is most commonly used in criminal rape, murder, and child abuse cases. In the 1990s, when DNA testing started uncovering wrongful convictions, one primarily on bite mark testimony, according to the Innocence Project, 24 people, including Richardson, had been exonerated after they were either convicted or arrested because of the assertions of a bite mark analysis. A 25th, Douglas Prade, was initially cleared in Ohio, but that decision was overturned by an appeals court last March. Chris Fabricant, a director of special litigation for the Innocence Project, who specializes in bite mark evidence, estimates that there are still hundreds of people in prison today due to bite mark testimony, including at least 15 awaiting execution. It all comes back down to I'm just not questioning how these people do their jobs and then they get put on the stand and are essentially treated as omnipotent gods. Well, and it's even worse that it's not being questioned. Balco closes out his article, quote, Every time someone has challenged the science of bite mark matching in court since 2009, the court has ruled the other way. In short, the scientific community has declared that bite mark matching isn't reliable and has no scientific foundation for its underlying premises, and that until and unless further testing indicates otherwise, it shouldn't be used in the courtroom, and so far, the criminal justice system has said it doesn't care. If bite mark matching is a bellwether issue for meaningful forensics reform, the prospects for meaningful reform appear to be dim. And that's the sad truth. And I mean, really, at this point, is there any chance that the U.S. hasn't executed at least one innocent person on bogus evidence like this? And that's really a sad thing. Is that there probably, there's probably, I would say, at least a 90% chance. Uh, more than that, probably. But the fact that courts just refuse to change what they're doing to match scientific understanding is inexcusable and a horrendous affront to justice. Bogosity.tv and all of its services are hosted at GoDaddy. I've been very satisfied with GoDaddy's services and their wonderful 24-7 customer support for over 10 years now. So I'm happy to be able to give you this special offer. Just sign up for any new domain, web hosting, email, or other service and get 35% off with the code WOWNOBOGON. That's W-O-W-N-O-B-O-G-O-N. Because there's nothing bogus about these savings on quality internet hosting. Just go to GoDaddy.com and use the code WOWNOBOGON. And now let's relocate this week's biggest bogon emitter. And this week, it goes to Judge Liam O'Grady, the judge in the Kim.com case we've been following. We talked in December about the government's bogus argument that .com is a fugitive when he's never been to America at any time in his life, and now the judge has agreed. Well, what do you know for once? <laughs> yep. It's as if judges are nothing but politicians in robes. Mm -hmm. So just to recap, what's going on is the government has basically seized all this stuff, all his money, taken all of it. And they've seized it on the basis that .com is a fugitive from justice. Mm -hmm. And what .com has said is that he just wants them to release enough of it that he can hire a lawyer and defend himself and then he'll come to America and do it. Well... How dare you be able to afford a competent defense? Yeah. Well, and if you remember how we've talked about how this works, what the government does is they don't sue the person, they sue the assets. And so in this, the case is USA versus all assets listed in Attachment A and all interest benefits and assets traceable thereto, which is .com's money and possessions. So you're not suing a person, you're suing inanimate objects. 
you're not on trial, just your stuff is on trial. Yeah. I mean, it just... It, George Orwell couldn't have written this better. <laughs> <sighs> so, it kind of sounds like that Don Com is trying to be reasonable. He just wants to go and be able to put on the legitimate offense. But guess what? Judge O'Grady said that's actually evidence of a conspiracy. Quote, The government has alleged that the conspirators knew that these files were infringing copyrights as evidenced by their exclusion of infringing files from the Top 100 list. The Top 100 list purported to list the most frequently downloaded files on Mega Upload, according to the government, an accurate list would have consisted almost entirely of infringing content, so the claimants carefully curated the list to make the site look more legitimate. In other words, the fact that they took down infringing links means that they must have deliberately left up all sorts of other infringing links. Additionally... The claimants regularly told copyright holders, including many U.S.-based organizations, that they would remove infringing content when, in actuality, they only removed particular links to the files. The actual infringing files remained on the mega-controlled servers and could only be accessed from other links. But there's nothing that says that those other links were necessarily infringing. I mean, if you have a DVD that you purchased and ripped, you know, you have the right to make a backup of it, You have the right to put it on your cloud storage, mega upload, or wherever. As long as you don't give the link around, you're not infringing. Well, what happens is someone else rips the same disk, puts it up there, and then sends the links around. What happens in mega upload, though, is they do deduping, which is where they say, hey, these two are the same thing. We're just going to store one copy to save space and then link to it from each person's account. So you have one link that's The person is keeping to himself like he's supposed to, and the other link is being spread around all over the place. Well, they would take down the link that's being spread around all over the place, but the judge is saying that because he didn't take down the other link, too, that he didn't actually take down the infringing content, and therefore he's responsible. Uh, Judges who have no idea how technology works are deciding its future. Yeah. Well, and also, a lot of these assets that they seized weren't even in the U.S., Guess what? The judge has no problem with that since some of the conspiracy took place in the U.S. That's good enough, I guess, just because people were in the U.S. were using a service for that. That's close enough. Oh, jeez. Petty tyrants are basically... Yeah. So then there's the whole fugitive stuff. Quote, As demonstrated, .com need not to have previously visited the United States in order to meet the prerequisites of Section 2466. The statute is satisfied where the government shows that the claimant is on notice of the criminal charges against him and refuses to enter or re-enter the country with the intent to avoid criminal prosecution. Because the court assesses intent under the totality of the circumstances, remember that, totality of the circumstances, it is certainly relevant that Dotcom has never been to the United States and that he has lived in New Zealand since 2011, where he resides with his family. This tends to show that he has other reasons for remaining in New Zealand besides avoiding criminal prosecution. However, the existence of other motivations does not preclude a finding that he also has a specific intent to avoid criminal prosecution. So we're going to look at the totality of the circumstances but ignore all the circumstances that don't match what we want and just look at the ones we want. God bless America. <laughs> Quote, Dot com statements made publicly and conveyed by his attorneys to the government indicate that he is only willing to face prosecution in this country on his own terms. Yeah, his own terms being wanting to be able to hire a lawyer and defend himself! Jeez. Yeah, apparently lawyers don't want to work for peewees. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get him a public defender, because those are always so good. It's a shame. Public anything always works. Just like public transportation. So all of this is bogus and a complete affront to jurisprudence, which means that only his dishonor, Liam O'Grady, could be this week's biggest bogan emitter. Bogosity.tv is a participant in the Amazon Services LLC Associates program, an affiliate advertising program designed to provide a means for sites to earn advertising fees by advertising and linking to Amazon.com. Just clear your cookies and go to Amazon.Bogosity.tv. 
or check the right-hand side of the podcast page for Amazon's best deals, including the deal of the day and limited-time lightning deals on all sorts of great products. So next time you buy online, go to amazon.bogosity.tv. And now let's descramble this week's Idiot Extraordinary. And this week, it goes to PayPal for the second time. The first time was last July, when they froze ProtonMail's account and asked them if they had government permission to encrypt emails. Now they're doing the same with Kim.com's new file cloud service, Mega, and I promise we're not linked to Kim.com anyway. We're not getting money from him. He's not sponsoring or anything like that. It's just that keeps being all these news stories involving him. You know, be perfectly fine with me if they left him alone and they talked about something else. But So PayPal closed the account for Mega. So you can no longer pay for Mega through PayPal. And apparently this was at the behest of Senator Patrick Leahy, one of the proponents of SOPA, if you remember that. Mm-hmm. And he put pressure on Visa and MasterCard, who in turn called on PayPal to terminate the account. And the reason why is Mega's encryption. Uh, what business does PayPal have shutting down a site over encryption? Well, and Mega has done what they can to comply with the law. Every relevant law they've complied with, anytime content owners need something removed, they've complied, they've responded quickly. They live up to all the requirements of the DMCA and all of the other laws in other countries. So the CEO of Mega, Graham Gaylord, said, quote, We consider the report grossly untrue and highly defamatory of Mega. It's very disappointing to say the least. PayPal has been under huge pressure. Yeah, it's a case of content owners not wanting to accept the realities of the current marketplace. Yeah. Well, and the thing about PayPal is, after they went and complained to them, they responded and actually apologized for withdrawing their account and acknowledging that their business was legitimate, but they're going to keep it blocked anyway because of its encryption. A.K.A. we don't want to piss off the government. We need uh, some excuse to keep this stuff locked. Yeah. But the interesting thing is that he says, quote, Mega has demonstrated that it is as compliant with its legal obligations as USA Cloud Storage Services operated by Google, Microsoft, Apple, Dropbox, Box, SpiderOak, etc. But PayPal has advised that Mega's unique encryption model presents an insurmountable difficulty. Well, the problem with that is SpiderOak is on that list. And if you don't know what SpiderOak is, it is probably the best cloud service for encryption and probably the only one that gives you true TNO encryption. I mean, if you put up a file to your SpiderOak account, they have no idea what it is. You know, the RIAA or whoever comes saying, we want to know what this is. Well, okay, we've got these blobs of pseudo-random noise with a unique number in front of it that we have no idea what it relates to. So, you want that? We can give it to you. Just tell us which one you want. But <laughs> that's, that's all they can give you. So, I mean, by all accounts, their encryption is just so much more robust than Mega's, and yet they can keep doing business. Yeah, it's... Ugh. I don't know what else I can say. It's just <laughs> so infuriating. So Mega is trying to find a replacement payment processor. And, of course, a lot of people have been screaming Bitcoin, but we'll have to see about that. But for now, all the accounts have had their subscriptions extended free of charge by two months while they try and work this out. And Mega said, quote, Mega supplies cloud storage services to more than 15 million registered customers in more than 200 countries. Mega will not compromise its end-to-end -end user controlled encryption model and is proud not to be part of the USA business network that discriminates against legitimate international businesses. Oh, well, that's nice, I guess. <laughs> so that means that PayPal once again becomes this week's Idiot, Idiot Extraordinary. Well, that wraps up this Miles O'Keefe edition of the Bogosity Podcast. As always, you can come to forum.bogosity.tv to read the show notes and join the discussion. 
This podcast depends on you to keep going, so please donate using the links on the website or at patreon.pagosity.tv and feel free to join in by sending a question, statement, news article, or rant to podcast at pagosity.tv. You can even stick it in an audio file if you want. Thank you for listening, and thanks again to Jonathan Loche for joining me. Thank you for having me. Until next time, here's a quote from Bruce Schneier. It is poor civic hygiene to install technologies that could someday facilitate a police state. The Bogosity Podcast is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Ported License. Bogosity. Do you want answers to creationist claims against evolution? Would you like to know more about evolution yourself, or even engage creationists more directly, with actual peer-reviewed sources to back you up? My book, How Evolution is Scientific, is designed to show the basics of evolutionary theory and how it is so well supported using the scientific method. It's impeccably sourced, with references to the actual scientific material, and is arranged using the creationists' own criteria of what is scientific. Using their own arguments against them, see how evolution is scientific, but creationism is not. Based on observations, accurate predictions, logic, and evidence. Get answers to common creationist claims, and even a primer on abiogenesis, the start of all life. It's all in my book, How Evolution is Scientific, available at Amazon, and on Kindle, EPUB, and PDF as well. Get How Evolution is Scientific and Never Be Taken In by Creationists Again. How last? No. What? Oh, she's been, I think she needs to go out and go use the bathroom. Uh, oh. your pit bull, what's her name? Alice. Alice. Baby girl, no baby girl. <laughs> First you gotta send oh. the file and then you can go poo. When the pit bull wants to poo, it's probably a good idea to have the pit bull poo. Yeah. I know, baby girl, and I know in a minute. <laughs> She's a sweet little baby girl. I, I know, baby girl, I'll be different. Okay, let me see here. But baby girl. <laughs> Bet she's a sweetheart. She is. She's just a little pain in the ass sometimes. That's having a pet. Mm-hmm.